All right, we have been looking at the book of Revelation, and we dropped the ball last week in chapter 9. We read a whole group of apocalyptic things, and then we ended the class. So <laughs> that's kind of how things work sometimes. Not planned, it just kind of worked out that way. Um, if you look at your outline by uh, Tinny, uh, you'll see where we are. There's the prologue at the beginning of the book of Revelation. We've looked at the first vision, which was Christ among the churches. And then the second vision is a long vision. Uh, it goes from 4.1 through chapter 16. And we've got the seven seals, the seven trumpets. We're going to have seven bowls of wrath. Uh, and there's going to be a parenthesis, which is a pause in the action. It doesn't mean that part's not important. It just means, oh, by the way, there's this. So this screen right here, um, this was a light bulb moment for me. Um, and if you kind of keep this in mind as we go on, I think this will be very helpful. Uh, come back to this often. Um, the seals are broken. That's revelation. And you remember the scroll had seven seals on it, and every time one of those seals was broken, something else was revealed. Things happen. All right? The trumpets are blown. What's a trumpet for? It's to announce something. All right? Here's warning. And so every time you hear a, a trumpet, there's something ha happening. There's something about to happen. And the bowls of wrath is punishment. All right? God is going to win is the bottom line. And that was a, a light bulb moment for me when I could... When I could, and write these down. It's not on your notes anywhere. <laughs> uh, seals are broken as revelation. The trumpets are blown. That's a warning. The bowls of wrath are poured out. It's punishment. And the bottom line is God's going to win. And, you know, to the people undergoing the persecution <laughs> and to us today, it looks like Satan's winning, doesn't it? Guess what? God's in charge. He's going to win. And we get to read the back of the book and see how the story ends. And this is how the story ends. God's going to win. At one point in Revelation, all the hosts of Satan are lined up on one side, and the hosts of heaven are lined up on the other side, and the battle is over as soon as it starts. Why? There's no competition. No competition. God's going to win. And so uh, whatever else you get from Revelation, that's the bottom line. All right? So this was, this was something that just, uh, and it was just a line in Roper uh, where he summed things up. And uh, Roper is the two-volume set of commentaries that, that we're using and if you want the details for that, I'd be glad to share them with you. Um, good summary right there. Where are we? Well, we're ready to start 9. Actually, we, we went through chapter 9. And let's open our Bibles there. I asked you to a minute ago, and then I didn't do it myself. And we finished really reading through... Uh, chapter 9 the last time. So in chapter 6, we had the first six seals. Chapter 7, we had the 144,000 in the first part. And in the second part, move my microphone up. <laughs> and in the second part, we had the multitude. And if you look at that in chapter 7, guess what? It's the same group of people. So then we've got chapter 8 uh, with the seventh seal and the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. So let me back up. If you notice, 
the seventh seal leads into the seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet leads into the bowls of wrath. So you can kind of know when one group ends, the next group is going to begin. So the trumpets now will symbolize partial judgments against Rome. Well, why do we know that? Well, it's going to be a third of something. Anytime you get into fractions, it's not going to be a complete destruction or a complete punishment. Uh, so that's a partial judgment against Rome. And why does this happen? It is to warn the people and encourage them to repent. This is God's goal always through history, to encourage people to repent. And I was just reading this morning, the very first, the, the verb to repent is one of the most common verbs in Hebrew. And, you know, all the way from Genesis chapter 1. And it's one of the first uh, verbs that Hebrew students learn is the verb to repent, because it's used so often. Can I move this down just a little? It's really loud or something. All right, we've got the first trumpet is hail, the second trumpet a mountain of fire, the third trumpet a star falls, and it is wormwood or bitterness that's translated. Here's the first loss of human life, uh, it's the opposite of the miracle at Mara in Exodus. And the fourth trumpet, a third of the sun, moon, and stars are going out. And this is really a common figure of speech used in apocalyptic literature. Uh, we see it often. And this is not a complete list. It's just uh, a selection. Uh, Joel 2, verse 25, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten the crawling insect. Uh, that's not the right reference. I don't have the right reference. Anyway, um, that scripture is for another place. See, you change your note. That's what happens. Uh, even in, in Acts chapter 2, we see this figure of speech of, of the sun and the moon and the stars uh, you know, being blotted out. And that when the stars are blotted out, the moon, sun, moon, and stars are blotted out, that means God's light is not going to be shed on that nation anymore. All right? They're not going to get the full glory of God's sun. That's S-O-N and S-U-N, uh, the same. All right, the first four trumpets, God is using natural disasters to bring men to repentance. Uh, the eagle's warning, uh, we read last week, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, <laughs> the worst is yet to come, all right? You ain't, you ain't seen nothing yet, we might say. And that's uh, 8 and verse 15. Now, if you look in chapter 9, and I found this quote, and I just stuck it in here. Uh, it doesn't really fit anything else, so I just kind of stuck it in here. In this chapter, there are more occurrences of the words as and like than in any other chapter in the Bible, which shows how difficult it was for John to describe the scene, which he saw in the vision. Now, imagine you are John, and you're seeing this vision. It's all this crazy stuff. Uh, and it's kind of like your dreams. Do your dreams always make sense? <laughs> Angie has some wild dreams. I don't, I don't ever remember any of my dreams, and I don't, I don't know why, uh, but very opposite. Uh, that's kind of how husbands and wives usually are, it's opposite, right? Uh, but she's just got wild and crazy things going on. Well, right here, John's seeing wild things, crazy things, and, and so he says it's, it's kind of like this, or it, he... Do, does this as a lion, you know. And what does that mean? Don't take this literally is the bottom line. If you try to start switching forth between what's symbolic and figurative 
and what's literal, it's not going to work. And people do that all the time. That's not good. <laughs> this whole section is symbolic, okay? That's where your cheat sheet comes in. Uh, and I, I'll update that even as we continue because the book will have some insight. Oh, well, this means this, or this is how this figure of speech was used. And I'll, I'll try to put in references uh, to how these uh, symbols are used in the Old Testament. Uh, and so very often, uh, the Old Testament is, is quoted there. All right, let's go to 9 then, chapter 9. And we will start reading with uh, verse 1 and the fifth trumpet. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. And he was given a key to the shaft of the abyss. Now, some translations will say bottomless pit. It's the same thing, all right? Verse 2, he opened the shaft of the abyss, and smoke rose out of it. Like smoke from a giant furnace, the sun and the air were darkened with smoke from the shaft. Then out of the smoke came locusts onto the earth, and they were given power like that of a scorpions of the earth. They were told not to damage the grass of the earth or any green plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their forehead. The locusts were not given permission to kill them, only to torture them for five months. And their torture was like that of a scorpion when it stings a person. In those days, people will seek death, but will not be able to find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. All right, so we've got a star falling from the sky. And when the star hits, it's going to be an angel. And he's going to be given charge of what comes out of the abyss. Uh, and so people want to say, well, who's this star? Uh, is it Jesus? He comes from heaven. You know, is it uh, Satan, one of Satan's angels? You know. And so here the question, is it a fallen angel or an angel given a job? And the bottom line is there is little difference. What difference does it make? It's an angel that God has given a job to, uh, a good angel, or it's one of Satan's angels that God is allowing to do a job. And so there's really no difference. Uh, one is an evil agent acting on divine permission, and the other is a good agent volunteering, voluntarily carrying out the benevolent purpose of God. So... There's not much difference there. So the abyss or the bottomless pit, what in the world are we talking about? Uh, it's something, it really has to do with the ocean. When a ship went down in the ocean, uh, it's never going to be seen again. Uh, they weren't as familiar with the bottom of the ocean. Uh, you know, I grew up on Jacques Cousteau commentaries. I knew about the bottom of the ocean. Uh, as a young age, they didn't know that, all right? They, once it goes down, it's like a bottomless pit. And so it is the abyss. Um, and so basically, and it's used in different ways in the Bible, but it is here used as the waiting place of the dead, okay? Then uh, the locust is going to be a large invasion, and this is where I was reading a minute ago, uh, Joel 2.25. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust is eaten, crawling locust, consuming locust, and chewing locust. And I've heard a sermon on that. It's really good. Uh, and we could spend some time just on those three things. My great army, he calls it. God says this group of locusts, this whole horde of locusts is my great army. What's he talking about? God uses natural means and uses countries to fulfill his purpose. Um, once Nebuchadnezzar, God called my 
hand. So when Nebuchadnezzar was conquering the uh, people of Israel, God says, I'm doing that. That's my hand. And so here, this swarm of locusts, God says, my great army, which I sent among you. All right, now the locusts in Revelation are going to be different. Why? <laughs> Don't eat the grass. <laughs> Don't eat anything green. That's what they usually eat, right? Uh, and they would come through a land and they would strip everything green. There would be not one plant uh, left alive. Why? They would eat everything. The, in Revelation 9, they're not eating anything green. You go out and you sting people, all right? So in those days, people will seek death and not be able to find it. Uh, the, they're going to be punished. They're not going to die. You don't die from a scorpion bite, usually. It just hurts a lot, all right? So here, they're going to, they're going to man, I wish I could die. They can't die. And there's references to that in the Old Testament as well. This is why God's people were sealed back in Revelation 7. All right? The seal of, of God on their forehead says, all right, don't bother this guy. Uh, during, and what does it protect them from? It doesn't protect them from physical harm. They were undergoing a persecution. It keeps them free from being overwhelmed. Why? Because we've got God on our side. It keeps them from uh, losing the hope of their promise, and they still had that. So five months, what's that about? If you look at your cheat sheet, what's the number five? It is something that is complete. Uh, I'm going to do this until it's time to stop, is what that means. Uh, I'm going to do this for five months. An iron breastplate. Oh, let me back up to verse 7. It's like horses prepared for battle. You got grasshoppers the size of horses. <laughs> and, you know, people just take this and make it into helicopters and, you know, all this modern warfare. Uh, don't go crazy with this. Why? It's an apocalyptic vision. All right? It means something. And the, I really believe the first readers could understand everything. Uh, and we've talked about that. Uh, so you got the horses. It just means really big, ho really big grasshoppers, that, the size of horses. And this crown that they're wearing, crowns of gold, that's the victory crown, uh, not the diadem, the, the permanent crown. Uh, that we're going to see. And you're going to see these two contrasted uh, later in Revelation. So this crown that they're wearing is a short, short term. So, yeah, Rome, they had power. Uh, they had prestige. They had influence. Um, it's temporary. All right. And all the politicians you see today, it's temporary. You know, you think all through history, uh, when you've lived, I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to 70 years old. I can remember great world leaders that, man, they were powerful, and they're gone now. All right? It's temporary, just like the, this crown here, temporary. All right? They had iron breastplates. You're not gonna. You're not gonna fight them back. Uh, you're gonna be helpless to to fight them. Is the idea. As a king, the angel comes out as of the bottomless pit. And so let's look at this. Uh, let's start reading in nine seven, and we'll go on down. Now the locusts look like horses equipped for battle. On their heads were something like crowns similar to gold. And their faces looked like men's faces. They had hair like women's hair. Their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like iron breastplates. And the sound of their wings was like the noise of the, 
of many horse-drawn chariots charging into battle. And they have tails and stingers like scorpions. And their ability to injure people for five months is in their tails. They have a, as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, in Greek Apollyon. The first woe has passed, but two woes are still coming. So here for five months, it will be a complete punishment uh, or a time limit will be set. And it's going to affect a third of the people. And, you know, there's going to be this punishment. And Rome was constantly being invaded by the tribes from the north. They were worried about the... uh, Parthians that were in the, in the east, uh, beyond the, the border of the Roman Empire, uh, what we would call Iran these days. <laughs> Sound familiar? You know, the names change, but the story is always the same, you know? Uh, it, how many times does that happen? Now, this Apollyon, possibly that's a reference to Apollo, uh, Domitian, who I believe was the emperor uh, when this was written, he kind of styled himself as a reincarnation of Apollo. And, you know, to them, what's the difference between a god and, a, you know, this emperor with all of this power and authority and majesty and all? That's a god. And so he considered himself deity. And, of course, in my mind, those Greek gods, they're little puny things compared to the true God. And we're going to talk about that again in a minute. Uh, But these people were worshiping so many idols. And the true God, you can't represent, you know, contain the whole of the universe in that little idol that they're bowing down to. Uh, It's just bizarre to us today. Now, why why would you do that? All right, what's all this about? Uh, All the details, we may not understand every minutia of details. What's, What's the bottom line? Unrepented of sin is going to bring destruction. And whatever else you get from this section, just know, if you don't repent of sin, you're going to be punished for that. Bottom line. Um, And God's trying to get them to repent. Always. And if you don't repent, there's, there's fruits of unrepentance. And we see that today in people's lives. When they're so involved in sin, they're paying for it with their life. And we see that so many times. And so in verse 12, uh, you've got the woes. The first woe has passed. Two woes are still coming after these things. A woe (laughs) is not just something you use to stop a horse. (laughs) Uh, That means, buddy, judgment is coming. There's going to be judgment, and there are plenty of references for that. So many times in Revelation, if you don't have a good handle on the Old Testament, this is going to be meaningless over here in Revelation. And, you know, we don't study the Old Testament maybe like we should, Oh, we don't care about that. It's all old stuff. We've seen in Hebrews and in Revelation, if you don't have a good handle on what was written aforetime, the New Testament says that was written for our learning. (laughs) All that Old Testament stuff is for our learning. If you don't have a good handle on that, this stuff over here in the New Testament, you're not going to understand it. And that's why, yeah, we need to take time to study the Old Testament deeply. And sadly, we don't get to do that as much as we should. And 
Maybe we should. All right, so Revelation 9, the summary so far, not a final judgment. Uh, the plague is only to hurt, not to kill. God says, don't, don't kill yet. Uh, the plague lasts for five months. It's going to be a complete plague. It's not final. And we're going to see uh, the purpose is to get men to repent. Let's just drop down and read the rest of this chapter, uh, beginning in verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a single voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God, saying to the sixth angel, the one holding the trumpet, set free the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour, day, month, and year are set free to kill a third of humanity. The number of soldiers on horseback was 200 million, and I heard their number. Now, this is what the horses and their riders looked like in my vision. The riders had breastplates that were fiery red, dark blue, and sulfurous yellow in color. The heads of the horses looked like lion's heads, and fire, smoke, and sulfur came out of their mouth. A third of humanity was killed by these plagues, that is, by the fire, smoke, and the sulfur that came out of their mouths. For the power of the horses resides in their mouths and in their tails, because their tails were like snakes, having heads that inflict injuries. Now notice this. The rest of humanity who had not been killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. So they did not stop worshiping demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that cannot see or hear or walk about. Furthermore, they did not repent of their murders, of their magic spells, of their sexual immorality, or of their stealing. What's the purpose of all this? Right here is the purpose, to get people to repent. He's using all of these things, all the troubles, to get people to turn to God. All right, so this plague is going to last five months. It's not a complete judgment. Why? Five months is, is a time limit on this. After that, uh, you don't get any more chances after that time limit. And really, isn't that what Second Peter says? This time that God gives us now is time for us to repent. After that, the earth and everything in it are going to be destroyed. That's what it says in the last part of Second Peter. So the trumpets are declaring what God has done and is doing all he can do to bring men to repentance. So the sixth trumpet, the war with mounted troop from the Euphrates... The Romans were worried about the Parthians, that Parthian empire um, that was on their eastern border. And they were on the rise, uh, and they're going to be coming west. They're headed for you, Rome. Uh, and so uh, the part about worshiping demons, and if you, if you notice that, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10. And verse 19. Hold your finger there in Revelation. Go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 19. I want you to see this. When people are worshiping their idols, what's going on there? Beginning in verse 19, what do imp I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? That an idol is anything? No, I imply what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Think about that. <laughs> they thought they were worshiping Apollo. They thought they were worshiping Zeus. They thought, you know... They're God. It's just a piece of stone. It's 
gold, silver, bronze, whatever it is, you know what you're really worshiping? You're worshiping a demon. And the demons don't accept that worship out of love. They hate you for it. Is that wild? Now, we don't worship idols anymore. I don't see anybody I know bowing down to an idol. What are our idols today? And this is, this is where you get into sermonizing. What are our idols today? You know, money, power, and, you know, all these things, selfishness. Sometimes I worship me when I have to buy all these things for me. Who am I really worshiping? I'm worshiping some demon that doesn't even love me. And in the end, I will be lost because I didn't repent and turn to God. Those demons are empty. They are worthless. All right. That's, that's my sermon for the day. Um, so read through that, uh, Psalm 135, another reference, uh, verse 15. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, nor is any breath in their mouth. Those who make them become like them. And so do all who trust in them. That idol is nothing. All right. God's going to win is the bottom line. So beginning in chapter 10, if you look at your outline, it's going to say it's a parenthesis. So what's going on? It's just here's the action. I saw these crazy things. And now, by the way, here's this. And so... Chapter 10 and 11 are actually part of the parentheses. And if you look down, the seventh trumpet really doesn't, oh, doesn't sound until chapter 11 and verse 15. And so all of this is, you remember we had the pause before with the seals. Now we've got the angel with the little scroll. And so let's read uh, 10 beginning in verse 1. Then I saw another powerful angel descending from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were like the pillars of fire. He held in his hand a little scroll that was open, and he put his right foot on the sea and his left on the, hand, on the land. Then he shouted with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he shouted, the seven thunders sounded their voices. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was prepared to write. But just then I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders spoke and do not write it down. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it and the earth and what is in it and the sea, and what is in it. There will be no more delay. Verse 7, but in the days of God uh, is completed, just as he has proclaimed to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice I heard from heaven began to speak to me again. Go and take the open scroll uh, in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said, take the scroll and eat it. We'll, it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. And it did taste as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Then they told me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So there is chapter 10. Let's go back up. Who's this angel with the little scroll? Uh, what's that about? The scroll is open. Uh, that means this is something that can be read. It's not sealed up yet. Uh, it's something, basically, it's going to be uh, the coming judgments. And he says, 
This is coming. Uh, who's this angel? And again, you know, is it a good angel, a bad angel? It's really irrelevant. It's either an angel of Satan that God is allowing to do his work, or it's a good angel benevolently seeking to do God's will. Um, it's a strong angel, a powerful angel. And there are three strong angels in heaven in 5, 2, 10, 1, and 18, 21. Some people want to make this Jesus. All right, why? Well, he comes from heaven. He's got a rainbow. Uh, he's got all this going on. Jesus is never called an angel. Angels are messengers, of course, and, you know, we're fascinated by them. They're messengers, all right? Don't, don't get too wrapped up uh, with angels. Um, so there are three strong angels. This means they've got a big job to do. Uh, so he's shouting a loud voice like a lion. And, you know, I've never actually been in, like, the savanna or whatever out in the open and, and heard a lion roar. I've heard him roar in zoos, but I felt pretty safe there. Now, if I was out in the open and I heard a lion roar, <laughs> what kind of, would that get your attention? Yeah, I, I think it would. Uh, and that's the idea. It's going to be loud, it's going to be scary, and it's going to get your attention. And, and that's the idea here. The seven thunders, uh, buddy, this is going to be a booming thing uh, that really gets your attention. There's seven. What does that mean on your cheat sheet? <laughs> it's the perfect number. Uh, it's going to be complete. It's powerful is, is what that means. Now, the seven thunders sounded their voices. Now, when the seven thunders speak, what's, what's John told? You seal that up. What does it mean when, you, when he says seal something up? Don't write it down. Don't make it known. Why? The time for warning is now past. The time for warning, you're not going to get any more warnings. And, you know, people want to believe in a, you know, oh, loving God could never punish people. You know, loving God, uh, he wouldn't do that. Guess what? God is patient now. And Second Peter uh, says this again. God is patient all through this time. What's it for? It's to get us to repent. There's going to come one day that patience is going to run out. That patience is going to end. And guess what? No more warnings. Your warnings are all used up. <laughs> when your mom and dad say, <laughs> strike three, <laughs> Uh, that's the third warning. <laughs> you know, then punishment comes. All right. Here's our, here's our, here's our warning time. And you know, when your mom and dad use your middle name, uh, you know the jig is up. <laughs> is that the way it was at your house? When my mom and when my mom mainly when she said Ronald D, uh, the jig was up, and that's right here. Jesus is always given an unmistakable title. And I love this chart. You look at all the places Jesus is referred to, and I'm not going to read all of these, but always it's unmistakable when we're talking about Jesus. Uh, and so here in chapter 10, we don't have that. He's called an angel. I'm going to say it's an angel. All right, I'm not, you know, I, don't, I really don't think it's Jesus. But I, I love charts like this. Uh, you know, I love a good chart. Uh, so here's the places Jesus is definitely referred to, and he's got titles. Uh, and right there, you know, you could preach that any day of the week. Um, I love that. All right, the little scroll, it's not mis mysterious. Uh, and... Revelation's going to use mystery. That, just, that doesn't mean mysterious, all right? It just means it hasn't been revealed. And that's true throughout Scripture. There's nothing mysterious or mystical about anything in the Bible. It just means it's 
revealed or not revealed is, is what that means. So this scroll the angel's holding up, it's going to contain the judgments of God on those who reject him. The seven thunders we, we mentioned uh, in Amos 3, 8, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Here's the Lord speaking. It sounds like a lion. Back up. Seven thunders. We've got uh, the perfect warning. No more delay. Uh, it says in the ESV, the KJV says, no more time. Time has run out. Uh, the idea of sealing up, we mentioned before, Deuteronomy 29:29. 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So to seal something up or to open it uh, is really dependent on God. God doesn't tell us everything he, he knows. Uh, one book couldn't contain that. He tells us what we need to, to know. And, you know, we have what we need for life and for godliness, the New Testament says. So the seventh trumpet, the mystery is revealed uh, in the seven, in verse seven, in the days of the seventh trumpet, uh, the angel's about to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God is completed. So what's been revealed or what's been hidden before, now it's going to be opened up. It's going to be revealed. Uh, the angel blows his trumpet. Uh, that's when this is going to happen. Uh, and we see that there. Uh, basically, it's going to be when Satan, or <laughs> when the seventh trumpet is blown, here's Jesus Christ, who is the redeemer of the world. And that's going to be the key to this section. The sweet and bitter scroll. What's that about? God's word, when we take it into us, is sweet because it's the word of God. The message, when we fully digest that, is going to be bitter. And what's that? You know, sometimes we've got people we love and they don't accept the word of God. Well, the, what's the word of God say? We, that's the sweet part. And the answer is bitter. We, we don't, we don't want to hear that. If they don't turn to God, what's going to happen? That's bitter. That's hard. And here's John. He's taken in the word of God, and it's sweet because it's the word of God. Uh, Romans 6, uh, 17, or uh, Romans 16, uh, talks about the word being manifest or opened up. Um, Romans 16, beginning in verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you, and according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures, which made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, to God alone be wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. This mystery that was hidden for ages, what is it? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to be the answer. Now is made manifest. We see Jesus Christ in history. That cross is the center point of history. Everything before it is leading up to it. Everything after points back to that cross. Now it's made manifest. All right, I wish I had five more minutes. <laughs> First Peter 1, 10, and Ephesians 3, 1 through 14. Uh, Lord willing, that is where we will begin next week. The bottom line, don't let any of this scare you. Don't let it keep you awake at night. The things you need to think about when you're going to sleep, God's in charge. He's going to win. That's what you need to think about. Thank you.